Okay, so uh, let us begin with a word of prayer. Dear loving Heavenly Father, we give thanks that we can meet together with the technology that's available to discuss your word. We pray your presence to be with us, to be our guide and our teacher in this year presentation. Help me to present it in a manner which is pleasing to you and that may edify your people. We give thanks for the light that you've been shedding upon us on the path. Uh, may it be used, Father, for the, the harvest of souls and to prepare us for your soon coming. Um, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so I'm going to share the screen. Okay, so in February of, of this year, I had done a study in the, I think it was Canadian or American group, uh, concerning claimings from the book of Ezekiel. <clears throat> and I got as far as chapter 36, uh, um, but obviously I was just going through points here and there. I wasn't going through the whole uh, study. I had been uh, chosen to do like a, a study with a little group here in the UK. And I've been through Ezekiel doing them studies. And um, at that there time, I'd, I'd just gone up to about chapter 36. So that was all that was kind of ready to present. And I was just sharing some of the things that I had found um, up to that time, which were maybe kind of, uh, some of it was review, but some of it was new, some new things. And uh, I really like a lot of Hello. And uh, I want to sort of continue on from that. Uh, and uh, really focusing on Ezekiel chapter 37. But before we get there, I just want a brief review of some of the things I shared. I have added some new things as well um, that I didn't present in February. And... Um, so, but this is some of this is review. So, um, so just that second paragraph says there, it's in here, it says the last books of the Old Testament shows workers taken from their laborers in the field. Others were of men of high ability and extensive learning, but the Lord gave them visions and messages. These men of the Old Testament spoke of things transpiring in their day. And Daniel, Isaiah, and Ezekiel not only spoke of things that concerned them as present truth, but their sights reached down to the future and to what should occur in these last days. <clears throat> so Ezekiel is fairly pertinent uh, to our time. I had done this here contextual timeline for where Ezekiel prophesied, so he was contemporary there uh, with, with Daniel and uh, Jeremiah as well, Jeremiah being in uh, Judah and Ezekiel being in Babylon. Um, and concerning the prophecy in, in the river Kibar, so this vision was given to Ezekiel at a time when his mind was filled with gloomy forebodings. He saw the land of his fathers lying desolate. The city that was once full of people was no longer inhabited. The voice of mirth and song of praise were no more heard within her walls. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so this year vision, um, I believe this is like this first vision. Now this is, would be in the year 592 <clears throat> and Jerusalem was destroyed in 586. So uh, it was at that their time, there was still in, some people inhabiting Jerusalem. It wasn't quite the same number <clears throat> as there had been. Uh, there was a considerable amount of people taken during the reign of Jehoiakim and Jehoiachin. <clears throat> but my understanding here is this year, Ezekiel is really saying not Jerusalem at that their particular time, but uh, what was going to come about. Uh, envision and you know, by what really the other prophets were saying as well that he was maybe reading what they were saying considering Jerusalem would be destroyed and uh, 
<clears throat> that he was sort of seeing this here uh, in vision at that their time. <clears throat> um, so one of them um, sort of uh, depopulation factors came during the reign of uh, Jehoiakim, I think, and uh, Jeremiah 52 verse 28 notes that in the seventh year of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, 3,023 people were carried away captive. <clears throat> So that would have been around the time of Jehoi Chin, Kim, sorry. Uh, this year number is actually uh, 300 and, 300 and uh, 43rd prime number. And 343 is uh, 7 times 7 times 7. And this is in the seventh year of Nebuchadnezzar. And then in the eighth year of his reign, it talks about him taking away the princes, mighty men of valor. And then 10,000 captives, uh, craftsmen, smiths. Uh, he left the power of the land there. Uh, he carried Jehoiachin away to Babylon. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> this is going to be the captivity that um, Ezekiel is going to be referring to. It says in Jeremiah 29, verse 1 and 2, it says, now these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the residue of the elders which were carried away captives and to the priests and to the prophets. So he's speaking about them who were carried away. So this would have been pertinent also to Ezekiel uh, being one of the prophets there in uh, Babylon. And then the 30th year he uh, some people would relate this well. Ezekiel, he's a priest. There it says there he's a priest. So if you're a priest when you're 30 years old. So some people thought that uh, this was uh, Ezekiel's age. But we're blessed to have the spirit of prophecy. And um, she says, Behold, thou Ezekiel art wiser than Daniel. So she's quoting here, I think it's Ezekiel 28, around that time. Uh, says, Thou art wiser than Daniel, there is no secret that they can hide from thee. So then she says, she's actually writing, I think she has this, this is her sort of parenthesis. Um, and it's actually applying to the king of Tyre, but she's changing it to Ezekiel, applying it to him. And uh, she says, the Lord God favored Ezekiel, the old and experienced servant of the Most High. He was older than Daniel. And then she relates to him as being like a father uh, to Daniel, giving him encouragement as a father would to his, to his children. And Daniel had been taken captive in 607. And now right here says that he was 15 or 16 years old. So that would place and being born, Daniel being born in either 623 or 622. And uh, I, I tend to favor 622. And um, so Ezekiel, sorry, if Daniel then uh, was born at that their time, and Ezekiel here is in 592. So that meant Daniel would be 30 years old. And if Ezekiel is going to be a father, if he's going to be the old and experienced servant of the Most High at this here particular time, you know, we can see he's going to be maybe at least maybe 50 years old or so. So that their 30th year does not apply to Ezekiel's age. But what it does apply apply to is uh, the understanding that is that it's relating to a jubilee year. And uh, we have this here two periods. We have like a date and span correlations the Lord has been sure to show us um, and the, the one of the most famous dates is 70 AD and the, and the first, one of the most famous spans of time is uh, 70 years, so we have a date, 70 AD and a span 70 years um, and uh, we've been finding quite a lot of, of these here, date span correlations <clears throat> And identifying this year period of the 30th year of a jubilee 
that means that means the 40th ninth, 49 years are going to be up in uh, 573 BC, and that takes us to Ezekiel 40 verse one, where we find it's the tenth day of the seventh month, and uh, this comes this can be followed then by a period of 36 years. Uh, till we till we get to the when Cyrus ascends the throne, and there we have the end of the seven years. And this year is parallel, and with the four hundred and ninety years. So here we have forty nine years, which connects with these forty nine years in this structure. Um, we have the year thirty four AD and the close of probation for ancient Israel, and that's going to be followed by thirty six years to seventy AD. Which, which connects to the end of the 70 years as a span. Um, we have 34 years prior to this year, uh, 49 years period ending, uh, from when the Babylonian captivity began. And that sort of connects to the 34 AD date. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, another thing of note, <clears throat> that uh, Ezekiel, he's referring to the captivity in the Ezekiel 1, uh, verses 1 to 3. He references the fifth year of the, the captivity of Jehoiachin, and it's the fifth month, sorry, the fourth month and the fifth day of the month. And we've connected that to the 21st of July, 592 B.C., uh, which connects to the fifth day of the fourth month in 1844, also being the 21st of July, but that time being in the Gregorian calendar. And when I was at the camp meeting there in Canada, uh, if you take that there, date when Jehoiachin was taken captive, there's actually a, a tablet that was found in Babylon uh, relating to Jehoiachin's captivity. And uh, it was the second day of the 12th month, which corresponds to this year date. Now, if you count there, five years, four months, and five days, and just like uh, a normal count of four months, uh, it's actually, it will take you to the fifth year, the fourth month, and the fifth day of Jehoiachin's captivity. So that sort of date, date sort of corresponds to the all kind of all calendar. Does uh, someone want to make a comment? Uh, Ezekiel talks about wheels within wheels and um, talks about these here wheels appearing in such confusion, but uh, the Spirit of God revealed to him as moving and directing these wheels and brought harmony out of confusion. Uh, so the whole world was under his control. Um, pretty much when we're looking back in history, it appears chaos, but these here structures that God has been revealing, as we, we can see a harmony coming out of uh, these historical events. And uh, I made a note when I was in uh, Canada of chronological light coming before a change of uh, compartment changes in the sanctuary type. I have sort of thought about that and refined it slightly. And um, we noticed that chronological light came by William Miller um, to him uh, concerning uh, when Christ was going to move from the holy place to the most holy place. Now, William Muller didn't understand that at that time, nor did he come to understand that, but, uh, but that was later revealed. And there's some statements there. I think um, Theodore had been dealing with some of these things uh, during the past week in the studies. He talks about the chronological periods. periods. He was talking about the 65 years uh, that we find in Bliss. Uh, the memoirs of William Miller, but we don't have that in uh, the Great Controversy. It's been taken out, and uh, we um, so we know there was chronological light given to Miller, 
prior to Christ moving into the most holy place. And then when Christ moved into the holy place in 31 AD, when he ascended. And then we have Pentecost, um, now according to the Holy Spirit, when he was inaugurated and began at work as a high priest in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary towards a lot of chronological light, specifically more related to Daniel chapter 9 of the 70 weeks prophecy. And we know that uh, Christ uh, was baptized in 27 AD. That was at uh, the end of 483 years. And that, uh, that was the time was fulfilled. So we had this here chronological light occurring then. So uh, Christ, he was uh, crucified on the earth. So the understanding would be then that the lamb was slain, that typifies that uh, cross of Christ. Uh, that lamb slain was then took place in the outer court of the tabernacle. And so therefore the outer court of the tabernacle would relate to the ministry of Christ when he is on earth. Uh, so for when he is born, 4 BC, and uh, then he ascends to your high priest on the 7th of June, 31 AD. And before that there, you have this here chronological light in the 70 weeks prophecy uh, being revealed, the time was fulfilled and so forth. And then before he uh, began, transfers his Ends his uh, work as a high priest in the, in the holy place. Um, we have this here chronological light. Again, this is the stars sort of symbolizing this, as I just chose that as a symbol to signify this chronological light. But before this here move into the most holy place, we're going to have this here chronological light given to William Miller. And I believe that before he returns to deliver his people, and end his work in the most holy place. I believe God has been showing us a lot of chronological light. So this is like a harbinger of the soon coming, this here chronology that uh, he's been revealing it to us. Now, you know that a little bit of a difference between uh, the chronology here and for he ascended and the chronology here with relating to Miller in that uh, these were applying to specific events. And uh, I'm not saying that this chronology here that we're finding is going to sort of help us give us the day of a particular event. Um, so uh, uh, later in our study of Ezekiel, we had these here four creatures. Uh, one was like a, a lion, one like an ox, uh, one like a, an eagle, and one of the face of a man. So these were like cherubims. Um, and we had related these here to the zodiac. And we find that they are in their uh, the, the perpendicular points of a zodiac uh, with, that we find sort of a... Uh, so, uh, the star signs, not, not the stars, are the constellations which match these here animals. So this here would be the, uh, the eagle would line up with the uh, Scorpio. So sometimes I think this here Scorpio had previously been related to a serpent or uh, a scorpion or to, sorry, to an eagle in the past. And uh, so that aligns where Aquarius aligns with the man, Taurus with the bull. And Leo uh, the lion. Um, uh, in eighteen forty-four, uh, the sun had just entered Leo, just prior to the fifteenth of August, where the midnight cry took place. Um, and uh, this is like the loud cry taking place. With the sun was in Leo, and just before that, there uh, took place. <clears throat> and you have uh, in eighteen forty. You have an angel, which is Christ, with a face like the sun, and he's uh, he speaks with a loud voice as a lion roareth. So you have uh, like a sort of connection there with the sun and Leo, 
just at this here time when there's a, a loud cry, you can maybe connect them, uh, have some connection between them frame marks. <clears throat> so there's some ideas I have. Maybe the video with the 12th hour. Uh, it's the 12th hour of the part of the workers of the vineyard that the, uh, that the, 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 the work ends. But uh, I know that the 12th hour would relate to when it gets dark, that would be or 6th hour in the uh, time of the Jews or in the time of the Hebrew reckoning of the day of clipping the hours. Uh, but it aligns with us, 12 o'clock uh, relates to uh, the 12th hour and in a sense could relate to midnight. And it's at midnight when Christ comes and uh, you have in Isaiah 31 verse 4 uh, the Lord is like a lion, uh, a roaring lion, it says there, and so shall the Lord of hosts come down to fight for Mount Zion. So uh, we have, it's at midnight, uh, the sun appears, for some reason it's at midnight, but the sun's still appearing, uh, and according to, so it's going to be like a, metaphorically midnight, uh, when we have, have this here voice of God uh, saying, it is done. Um, the Lord coming to deliver his people in the great controversy. Um, this year, date of Ezekiel in 592. Uh, just connect or sort of like uh, spans and connections we can find with it. Uh, it was from when the door was shut in the flood, 1798 years. And that was in from uh, Riot, 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 Sorry, sorry, we relate the flood to 2390 BC, and then it's 2390 years to the time of the end in 1798 from Ezekiel's uh, vision and by the Chibar. And uh, it's going to be then uh, prophetic days 46 times 360 uh, to the 1844. And prior to the flood, you're going to have 46 times 36 which is the number of years uh, from creation. So I'm just uh, going to move on to uh, our main. I'm just sort of glancing over this. I don't want to spend too much on this. <laughs> this is more like a review. But uh, just as I was looking at going over this again, there's some things I'd forgotten. Um, so Colin had recently uh, aligned our disappointments with the 1844 and uh, the 1533 days there, uh, from the 11th of August 1840 to October 22nd, 1844. And he had aligned that with when Trump was elected in the 9th of November 2016. It was 1533 days until Biden took office on the 20th of January uh, 2021. And he counted uh, 1347 days to the first disappointment and then it's 187 days to the second disappointment. Um, when Trump uh, was elected, it kind of empowered our message which sort of paralleled the empowerment of the first angel the 11th of August 1840 and then we had a disappointment in July 18, uh, 1347 days later and then there was like a, like a second disappointment when Biden I was in office on the 20th of January, uh, 2021. So Trump wasn't going to be the last president as we had predicted. But, uh, just reminded this year, the prime number, 1347 is the 11,000, well, basically 11,117 prime number. And 187 is, um, Sorry, 1,117 is the 187th prime number. And uh, just kind of just brought that to my memory again. Um, so I'm not going to a lot of this. Um, so we had an Ellen White saying here. Uh, to me, I kind of related it to why we had to give our Nashville uh, a prediction. So are we to wait until the fulfillment of prophecies of the end before we say anything concerning them? 
Of what value will our words be then? Shall we wait until God's judgments fall upon the transgressor before we tell him how to avoid them? Where is our faith in the word of God? Must we see things foretold to come to pass before we will believe what he has said? In fear to think, rays, light has come to us, showing us that the great day of the Lord is near at hand, even at the doors. Let us read and understand before it is too late. So she's quoting this in relation to Ezekiel 33, uh, when he's told to warn the wicked. And this has its parallel previously in Ezekiel 3. Um, after that, Ezekiel 3, we have 390 days and for the 40 days where he's going to lie on the side which we had related to uh, to Nashville this is uh, Ezekiel lying on the side 390 days and then 40 days so we have here the 15th of August was the date that he kind of changed sides so he was looking in a sense to his uh, mock up of the destruction of Jerusalem and then he turned the rights I side and look back at this here way and since you could say his focus then was really on the 15th of August um, and um, this year it has come up this year 391 various sort of uh, equations you know if you take the hours of the parable of the workers in the vineyard and square them we have number 391 and uh, and then if you just add the hours, it's 41. It sort of connects to uh, 390. And now he was going to the sage, but if you're going to go to the destruction of Jerusalem, you just add an extra year. And we have the fifth day, it's for the 15th day of the eighth month, I've been quite prominent in the worship of Jeroboam, uh, the false worship in 977 BC. And then this is when the uh, 15th day of the 8th month comes up again, at the end, near the end of these 1590 years, which uh, Ezekiel was going back to this time, 977. And then that connects to 1844, when you have Samuel Snow uh, given the, light, the midnight cry going at the Exeter camp meeting, and the 15th day of the 8th month will be our 15th of August. <clears throat> Um, so I had uh, some observations concerning the chapters in the book of Ezekiel. Uh, Ezekiel's first date uh, can covers from chapters 1 to 7. And then in Ezekiel 8, we have another date, the fifth day of the sixth month <coughs> of the sixth year of Zedekiah. And uh, that covers uh, 12 chapters. And then Ezekiel 20, verse 1. You know, the, that day it covers four chapters, and then Ezekiel 24, verse 1, uh, we just covers that one chapter. <clears throat> and then after that, he's going to leave off, he's going to be mute. He's not going to prophesy concerning Jerusalem uh, to any degree. After that, it's going to be like dumb. So this message is then going to go to the other nations, to Ammon, to Edom, to Egypt, to Tyre, and so forth. and um, you can maybe align these here with the sanctuary. So these here first seven chapters relates to the seven branch candlestick. And then the next 12 chapters in the next state, we have the 12 loaves of showbread. And then in chapter 20, we have four chapters. There was uh, four horns in the altar of incense. And then uh, chapter 24, uh, we just have the, the Ark of the Covenant, just relating to that one. Uh, one chapter and uh, when Ezekiel uh, began to lie on his left side it was the 390th day of that prophecy and it was um, well sorry when he, after the 390th day of that, that prophecy uh, when he lay on his side it was the 10th day of the 5th month and then we have this here prophecy a year later on the 10th day of the 5th month and that's uh, Ezekiel 20, verse 1. And then the temple will be destroyed four years later, on the 10th day of the 5th month, in 586 BC. 
And then we have the 10th day, the, the fifth month, when the temple will be destroyed again in 70 AD. And that's going to be 655 uh, years later. And I just had this here. To me, it's a kind of just a thought. I'm not predicting anything. But I'm just thinking, could it be that what we did, did with Nashville, uh, we had the 18th of July. Now, in the Gregorian calendar, the 26th of July, sorry, the, the sorry, the 18th of July in the Gregorian calendar is uh, the 26th day of the, of the fourth month. But the 18th of July in the Julian calendar is the 10th day of the fifth month. And um, so four years from that uh, would take us to uh, 2024. And the 15th of August is the 10th day of the fifth month. And uh, we could maybe, was I just have this here thought, were we maybe predicting, were we for fulfill, fulfilling uh, Ezekiel here rather than uh, this year sort of symbol, you know, at this year point? And uh, is it Nashville going to be destroyed uh, then rather than uh, on July 18? Um, uh, some people, uh, I remember one of the, um, that the judgment or per person, um, Michael, somebody, I can't remember his other name, McCaffrey, McCaffrey, he done a, a presentation called Plea by Fire. He, uh, he mentions the July 18 prophecy. And then one of the comments uh, in that there, uh, the comments to that there YouTube presentation, sort of somebody said suggests that it's going to be 120 years from when the vision was given in 1904 uh, to 2024. And the, so we're sort of connecting 2024 as well to 120 years uh, when Noah began to construct the ark. And I sort of uh, was aware, became aware that uh, the midpoint when Noah was constructing the ark. He was, uh, 540 years old. And we can maybe take that as a symbol of the fifth day of the fourth month. And, uh, that when he was 540 years old, that was in 245th, 2450 BC. And then it's going to be 1844 inclusive years to the Babylonian captivity it begins in 607. And then William Miller began the Great Jubilee. There was for 49 times 50, which is 2,450 years. And that would take us to 1844. And we have there the symbol of the fifth day of the fourth month occurring then, which parallels Noah being 540. And, uh, we can even go back from 607 BC, 500, sorry, 1904 years. To when the ark began, and these here 120 years to the flood, and then 60 years to the midpoint, and then from 1844, it's 60 years to the Nashville vision, and then 120 years to 2024. Now I anticipate that uh, 2024 would come to go by, and Nashville will still be there. So I'm not. Uh, <laughs> And that, uh, but it's just a thought I'm just putting out there. So in the study, I had uh, gone through Ezekiel. Just, I'm just browsing through here. And uh, I had some mentions of um, this here in uh, chapter 14. We have Noah, Daniel, and Job being mentioned. And with Noah, Daniel, and Job, uh, says that we can associate particular years. For instance, Noah, we could attribute to 120 years, where he found grace in the eyes of the, uh, well, he found grace in the eyes of the Lord and began to build the ark, uh, prior to the flood, 120 years. And Daniel, we could associate with the seven years captivity. We find that in Daniel 9, verse 2. And Job lived 140 years. And when we go to 457 BC, 
Uh, Ezra leaves Babylon the first day of the first month and arrives on the first day of the fifth month. We have there 120 days, which could align to the 120 years of Noah. And then it's going to be 70 days, prophetic days, to the tenth day of the, of the seventh month, which uh, connects with Daniel being 70 years uh, to them, 70 years of Daniel that he so I was aware of that prophecy of it's found in Jeremiah, but he uh, re refers to it. <clears throat> and then we have 140 days to when the decree um, is in a sense executed. We have a law of separating strange wives on the 20th day of the ninth month. <clears throat> From when Israel arrived. So we have them for 140 days, which connects to 140 years. And you can connect Noah, Daniel, and Job with three other people. Uh, Noah with his sons, uh, Daniel had three companions, and then Job had three miserable comforters. This is a, that's just like a, a brief review. <laughs> so this took about over half an hour. <clears throat> so what time do I have? Do, you, do I normally just have an hour? I think that's all I have, isn't it? So um, we'll we'll start. We'll see how far we get through anyway. So Ezekiel chapter thirty-seven uh, deals with the Valley of Dry Bones and then the joining of two sticks, which has been uh, part of the theme that the Theodore has been sharing with us. Uh, the joining of the two sticks during the last past week has been part of that study. And so the first one says, the hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley and was full of bones and caused me to pass by them round about and behold, there were very many in the open valley and lo, they were very dry. So Ellen White says, before him lay a dismal scene. Throughout its whole extent, the valley was covered with the bones of the dead. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord, thou knowest. What could the might and power of man accomplish with these dead bones? The prophet could see no hope of life being imparted to them. And he said unto me, Prophesy unto, the bo unto these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, unto these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live, and I will lay sinews upon you, and ye shall bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. As he looked, the power of God began to work, the scattering bones were shaken and began to come together. Uh, so a shaking, uh, present tense. Elmite says, the mighty shaking has commenced and will go on and all will be shaken out. We are not willing to take hold, not willing to take a bold and unyielding stand for the truth and to sacrifice for God and his cause. And she says, we are in the shaking time. The time when everything that can be shaken will be shaken. The Lord will not excuse those who know the truth if they do not in word and deed obey his commandments. If we make no effort to win souls to Christ, we shall be held responsible for the work we might have done but did not do because of our spiritual indolence. Those who belong to the Lord's kingdom must work earnestly for the saving of souls. They must do their part to bind up the law and seal it among the disciples. And then we have some quotes where she applies the shaking uh, to a future sense. Uh, she says, the time, there is a time coming to the people of God, but we are not to keep that constantly before the people and rein them in, rein them up to have a time of trouble beforehand. There is to be a shaking among, among God's people. But this is not the present truth to carry to the churches. It will be the result of refusing the truth presented. 
And then she says, I saw some with strong faith and agonizing cries pleading with God. Their countenances were pale and marked with deep anxiety, expressive of their internal struggle. Firmness and great earnestness was expressed in their countenances. Great drops of perspiration fell from their foreheads. Now and then their faces would light up with the marks of God's approbation. And again, the same solemn, earnest, anxious look would settle upon them. Evil angels crowded around, pressing darkness upon them to shut out uh, Jesus from their view, that their eyes might be drawn to the darkness that surrounded them. And thus they be led to distrust God and murmur against him. Their only safety in keeping their eyes was in keeping their eyes directed upward. Angels of God had charge over his people. And as the poisonous atmosphere of evil angels was pressed around these anxious ones, the heavenly angels were continually wafting their wings over over them to scatter the thick darkness. Um, it's, uh, so this is uh, this is from to see his early writings. It's not coming up. Uh, so she says, as the praying ones continued with their earnest cries, at times ray, a ray of light from Jesus came over, came to them to encourage their hearts and light up their countenances. Some I saw did not participate in this work of agonizing and pleading. They seemed indifferent and careless. They were not resisting the darkness around them, and it shut them in like a thick cloud. The angels of God left these and went to the aid of the earnest praying ones. I saw angels of God hasten to the assistance of all who were struggling with all their power to resist the evil angels and trying to help themselves by calling upon God with perseverance. But his angels left those who made no effort to help themselves. I lost, and I lost sight of them. I asked the meaning of the shaking. I had seen that it was shown that it would be caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the letter scenes. This will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver and will lead him to exalt the standard and pour forth the straight truth. Some will not bear this testimony. They will rise up against it. And this is what will cause a shaking among God's people. So there we have just like another future sense of a shaking. And then verse 8, And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up among, upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then he said unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds of breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. And so slain, in a spiritual sense, these uh, men are slain by sin and slain by the words of the Lord's mouth, killed with the law, specifically the transgression of the law. That's my comment, uh, the killing letter. And it is only the Spirit of God that can give them life. So I think this is like John Gill commentary. Uh, prophesy unto the wind. What brings the dead bones to life is prophecy. This will be chiefly from the books of Daniel and Revelation. When the books of Daniel and Revelation are better understood, believers will have an entirely different religious experience. So that's a quote from Ellen White. Um, so the following quote, we can discern that the books of Revelation contains the messages to ripen the harvest at the end of the world. And that which ripens the harvest at the uh, and that which ripens the harvest is the latter rain. So to John were open scenes of deep thrilling interest. In the experience of the church, we saw the position, dangers, conflicts, and the final deliverance of the people of God. He records the closing messages which are to ripen the harvest of the earth. So that would be the, the three angels' messages. We could relate that one to the angel of Revelation 18. Either as sheaves for the heavenly garner or as faggots for the fires of destruction. Subjects of vast importance were revealed to him, especially for the last church, that none who should turn from error to truth 
might be instructed concerning the perils and conflicts before them. None need be in darkness in regard to what is coming upon the earth. So the four winds relating to that which is global. Uh, and then shall he send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. So uh, it's uh, Christ speaking, I believe. And then the restraint of the four winds uh, relating to the saving of the 144,000. So uh, we read that in Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 to 4. It says, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in your foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and they were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. And Alma says, Men cannot discern the sentinel angels restraining the four winds, that they blow not until the servants of God are sealed. But when God shall bid his angels loose the winds, there shall be such a scene of strife no pen can picture. And we've related this here, um, saving. Um, we have like a similar passage in Revelation 9, verse 4. Uh, we have here this Revelation 3 compared to Revelation 9, verse 4. Um, it says, um, Revelation 9, we know, is relating to Islam. We have there in verse 3 of Revelation 7 saying, Heard not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God. In your foreheads, and then Revelation 9 verse 4 says, And we commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men who have not the seal of God in their forehead. And later, as you go to Revelation 9 verse 15, you have the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour day month in the year to slay a third part of the men. Um, so that we have here four angels in Revelation 7 as well. That are, they were about to listen to the four winds, but then, uh, they're, they are, um, held until God's people are sealed. So the listening of the four winds, uh, is synonymous with the seven last plagues. El White says, I saw that the four angels would hold the four winds until Jesus' work was done in the sanctuary. And then would come the seven last plagues. So towards the end of the seven last plagues, uh, the dry bones coming to life would relate to the resurrection of the righteous. But for the prophecy to relate to a time prior to the close of probation, events transpiring upon the earth would foreshadow that time of great trouble and would sound its soon approach, thus awakening men from their insensibility and arousing vivifying thoughts and actions. In this way, a prophecy from the four winds uh, can come to a time when probation is still open for God's people. This would relate to the time brought to view in Revelation 7, 1 to 4, when the four winds are restraining, or restra sorry, are restrained, and the saving of the 144,000 begins. As was noted, Revelation 9, verse 4, was seen to relate this time to the saving uh, with the involvement of Islam. So I have a diagram here. So we have the, the close of probation and the four winds are loosed. And, and applying that to a time prior to that, you know, God's going to have to have people raised up, uh, body formed and, uh, a reformation, a, revi a revival and reformation, it basically is what we're seeing here. We're having the bodies formed, which is a, a, a formation, a reformation, and then the breath is like a revival. And we know this would have to come during before the Sunday law, even 
And um, so there's an event that foreshadows that time of trouble. So we have here um, John saying, come from the four winds, or sorry, Ezekiel saying, come from the four winds. So he's basically taking something which is going to transpire events like a, a harbor, something like a harboring, what is going to transpire here, the terrible destruction, and he's going to sort of like bring it uh, to another time after the body has been formed and when breath enters the body. So we can have a, an event here that transpires, that occurs, that foreshadows this here time of trouble. The four winds are restrained and the saving of the 144,000 begins. And then um, we have the Sunday law, uh, when in a sense that's, there's a, a, I think Ellen White really um, says this here is going to take place, and then God's, there's like the saving has to take place. Look at the seven day witnesses have to be sealed by this here time. And then the, the message then goes to those outside Adventism. Those in Babylon uh, to come out of Babylon, and then verse ten. Uh, so I prophesied, and he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet an exceeding great army. So here we see a two-step process that is based upon the creation of Adam or Eve, as she was created from bone. And I've just compared there Genesis two verse seven with Ezekiel thirty-seven. So you have the man being formed of the dust, and there you have, I've lined that up with the, the body coming together, and then the breath into his nostrils, and then you have that, uh, he prophesies and commanded me, and the breath came into them, and then man became a living soul, and then you equate that with, and they left and stood upon their feet in the exceeding great army. Uh, Ellen White, she relates the dry bones to the world, to those who are dead in their sins. In this quote, and then she has an exceeding great army prior to the close of probation taking place. So uh, she says, them that honor me, I will honor. Let them honor him by joining the ranks of his workers. Um, the leader of the, the host of heaven is waiting for human agencies to enlist in his service. He will lead them forth in exceeding great army to the conquest of the world. Such a leader we may gain victory in every conflict. And then she says, an exceeding, uh, really an exceeding great army after the close probation. So in this quote, the phrase, is used in the context of the general resurrection of the righteous when all God's children would have been uh, resurrected to eternal life. And um, I'll not read that just for time. And then Hosea expresses the concept of the great army with uh, differing terminology. Uh, he says, yet the, the, yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered measured or not nor numbered. So sort of connects with that. And then um, verse eleven. Let's just see how much you have to go here. There, there's quite a lot, so I, I don't want to go on too much, but uh, kind of just reformation that I'll maybe do this for today. Because uh, I think the hour's up. So we'll just uh, maybe close there. Any thoughts, questions? So we're rushing the end, I haven't got too much done. But, um, we'll just uh, close with prayer. If there's no more uh, thoughts, I'll stop sharing. Yes, yeah, Stephen, are you going to um, send them notes out? Yes, I can do that. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'll add them to the chat. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, we'll uh, close the prayer. Uh, dear loving Heavenly Father, 
uh, we give thanks that uh, we can study these things and we know that we're approaching a time when um, there will be great calamities on the earth and we ask that you, we may receive that breath upon us, that we may stand upon this year earth and be in a mighty uh, an exceeding great army, that we can be part of that number, Father, and we pray that uh, we can be vessels that are purified and that are empty for your Holy Spirit to be to make full. And that we pray that, uh, that uh, we can sign that warning to this here world that uh, is soon to perish. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.